Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Lewis Beck. Welcome back to Hybrid Home Studio and the final installation or episode or whatever you want to call it of this season of 343 TV. I can already see there are a bunch of you uh, waiting in the chat. And so, what up? Uh, hello to John Kingston III, who is always here and has an epically regal name. What up, Andrew Duke? Always tuning in as well from Canada. And uh, I don't know who Space Facts is, but I like your name. And uh, Rashane, what's going on? And Stavros, I have seen you before as well, so welcome. And um, yeah, I appreciate you guys tuning in. I really, really hope that this season, you know, has been an effective uh, kind of learning experience for you in music production and also a learning experience in watching me attempt to get my hat to be straight in an inverted visual, which always seems to be going on. Uh, what up, Luis? And what's up, of course, Nefertiti? Welcome back. So um, today, what I'm going to be doing is I actually watched this movie, uh, the net new Christopher Nolan movie, Tenet, last night. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me. And I was super inspired by the sound design in that movie. I was just listening the whole time going like, wow, this is amazing. I have no idea what anyone's saying or anything that's going on. And uh, yes, thank you, TD, TWD Industries. I am very cozy today. Um, yeah, I know. Anyway, so I was watching this movie. And I was like, I have no idea what's going on. I can't hear anyone saying. But this music is really good. So what I figured I would do today is uh apropos to the title of the of the of the topic for this final episode which is processing analog synths what i figured i would do is i would make a um i'm gonna make a film score for a movie that doesn't exist um and so what that's gonna basically what yeah tenet was super dope uh i liked it it got a lot better the second half. The first half I was watching, I was like, this is a terrible movie. But uh, I love Christopher Nolan. And, uh, you know, so anyway, I want to leave leaving the, the movie banter aside. What I am going to do is just let's we're going to talk about how to really get in there and design and like and use analog synths to the most of their ability. And also how to process them in like really cool ways to get cooler, more far out sounds. Um so this will honestly like entail a lot of things that will be applicable to house and techno and other kinds of music as well. Um, but I think, yeah, I just have this idea of like doing this kind of fake film score, which will be fun um, and allow us to get really into sound design. It's supposed to like, trying to make a song where sometimes it's like, you know, we're trying to be too practical with the sounds that we're making. Anyway, so let's just jump right into this. Um, we're going to go ahead and pop... Oh, no, that's the Be Right Back screen. Sorry about that. Um, I clicked on the wrong thing. Okay. There we are. All right. So the way I'm going to start with this is the way that you always, you know, start with some crazy film score. Um, and that is going to be with some super deep sounds. So I'm going to start off with my... Uh, Voyager. And I guess we'll do this at. Let's see. So the thing about film scoring, and I've actually scored a, a couple of short films before, and I love love doing it, is that you don't really do it on the grid, right? You do it. Um, I do it more free floating in context with the the visual. But uh, that being said, what I'm going to do today is I am going to I'm going to kind of make some sort of grid situation uh, just so we it can be a little easier. So I'm going to go ahead and create my external MIDI instrument and uh, send it to my logic. I mean, so sorry, send it to my Moog channel and let's go ahead and get started. So, a couple of things real quick before I just, you know, start, like, making noises. Um, for those of you that are considering getting into the analog synth game or have gotten into, into the analog synth game, I want to kind of, like, give you some friendly words of advice and maybe even, like, I don't want to say warnings, but, you know, things just that, like, from my experience, uh, I think are 
probably useful to pass off to you, um, you know, who may just be new to this. Okay, there we go. So, when I first bought uh, an analog, the first analog synth I got was actually the Moog Voyager. It was under extremely ridiculous circumstances. Uh, that's really not usually the first synth you should get. Um, but essentially, Harry Romero, who I don't know if any of you guys know who that is, but he's a super legendary uh, house and techno DJ. I was in his uh, studio in New Jersey, and we were talking. And I was like, you know, I'm thinking about getting into uh, into you know getting some analog synths. And I'm like, do you have any recommendations for a first one? And he was like, how about you take that one? And he pointed over to the Voyager. I was like, are you serious? He's like, yeah, I don't really use it that much anymore. Like, uh, I'll give it to you for a very discounted price. Anyway, so we'll not reveal that price, of course. But uh, that's Harry Romero's Moog Voyager right there that I use every time I make music. I absolutely love it. Super powerful synth. Um, anyway, the reason I bring that up is because the first couple years that I owned it, I found myself being like a little bit disappointed with it. Uh, now, this is actually pretty early on in my music production career. Um, you know, I started like releasing records um, with in-house records when I was 21. Um, but I still had only started producing, you know, like really seriously when I was like 17. And so there was still a lot that I had to learn, even though I was already, you know, like making output at a professional level. Uh, and what, and it was a lot to learn also just about like the workflow of having an analog synthesizer, right? Because it's a huge difference between, you know, working with a digital synth that you could endlessly tweak and always, and almost more importantly, that you can go back and constantly, um, go back and constantly uh, change like the the melody that it's playing, right? And so the thing is with with analog synths, right, is that once you record it as audio, that's it. Like that's what you're stuck with, so to speak. Um, and so the key is is to start is is to like learn how to kind of still be really creative and flexible while using analog synthesizers without like kind of you know un unnecessarily hindering yourself or cutting yourself off of the knees creatively. Now the other thing that was surprised me about owning an analog synth, right, is I was like, man, uh, this doesn't sound as gooey and as you know, as crazy as I thought it would, uh, compared to digital synths. One thing that was like super apparent, especially with the Moog, was that like the bass was on a whole nother level, um, which tends to be the case with most analog synths. Um, that they just produce a a really huge low end, and it's just it's kind of specifically what happens from like fifty hertz and lower. That's really mind blowing, or like sixty hertz and lower, where it just has this weight and depth, and also actually clarity which certain digital synths don't have. Um, and then, of course, there's this dimensionality aspect to it, right? It just kind of sounds different on the speaker. Hard to explain. Um, but that being said, when it comes to putting a song, you know, a, an analog synth in a song, right, you, you want to be able to have it have it sound like it belongs there, right? And, and for instance, if you put it besides a, a digital synth, it should make total sense. Right, it should it should it should complement each other. It shouldn't be like, wow, this they sound so different. Like one sounds really good, and one sounds really bad. And so the first thing that I have to caution people about with analog synths is like, do not for one second think that because you bought an analog synth that your music is going to get better. It is that's not the case at all. Um, don't think for one second that because you bought an analog synth that your sound design is going to get better. It's definitely not the case. Uh, you still need to understand how to do good sound design to make an analog synth worth it. And so that was the thing that honestly was initially challenging for me was like I wasn't as good as sa at sound design yet as I am now um, and so now you know one, once I really started getting better at sound design um, you know it took the synth it, I, I rediscovered the synth and, and all my synths started having new meanings to me like as well as like the mini log you know um, which I have sitting to my left the mini log is a super powerful synth so don't listen to what anyone says about it. There's some people who knock it. They're like, oh, it's a little digital sounding. It doesn't sound fully this or fully that. If you understand how to design this thing, it's incredible. Right? So I also have a Prophet next to me. And I have a, uh, a, a Prophet 6 up there and a bunch of other modules and stuff. Anyway, so we're going to jump right into it. But I just wanted to, you know, say that especially since we're on holiday season and discount season and all this stuff that like if you're considering buying an analog synth because you're like oh i need to sound professional and upgrade my sound that's not going to be the thing that actually uh that does that you know 
Um, so understanding how to use the synth is much more important, you know? Like I always I always give this analogy when I'm talking about recording. I'm sorry I keep in the mic. When I when I'm talking about recording, when that like I'd rather have Jimi Hendrix on a one hundred dollar fender and a fifty dollar practice amp, you know, than some schmuck who's not very good on like a five thousand dollar guitar with a, you know, nineteen sixties vintage high quality amp and like the best recording situation because at the end of the day you're gonna get you're gonna get a better performance and a, something more usable and musical from Jimi hendrix on a shitty instrument than like someone who's not good on an amazing instrument or even someone who's just mediocre on an amazing instrument right so that's the key here right is that the analogy carries through to the synths is like if you have a really great synth but you don't know how to use it it's not gonna it, it doesn't sound good because it's that synth right you know like i've been working in this I worked in house and techno for a long time and produced in that and had a lot of friends in there. And, you know, I can't tell you how many times people would be like, oh, yeah, I work with all analog. I use only analog. And then, like, they send in their music and it sucks, right? It's like, well, what's the point? Who cares, right? Uh, so, anyway, all that being said, that's my little, like, um, uh, that's, that's my little diatribe. So, let's get started. Now, I, may, I tend to make a lot of presets on my synths um, because I, I, I like to design sounds and I like there are certain things that I like that I know I can come back to and use as starting points. So there's this one preset that I made recently that we're going to start with. And again, for those of you that might have joined in a little bit late and don't fully know what we're doing or what I'm doing today, is I'm going to make a movie score to a movie that doesn't exist. Maybe let's say I'm going to make a trailer for a movie that doesn't exist because the movie score will be a little bit long. All right, so first things first, uh, I don't want to, like, discourage anyone or make anyone feel bad, but I will, I will point out that we have to remember analog synths are not new, right? They were invented in the, in the 50s and 60s, and they really came onto the market as a popular instrument to be used in recording in the 80s, right? Uh, and that was during the the analog era of, of audio recording still, right? And so at the end of the day, one of the beauties of an analog synth is the electricity that runs through the circuits, right? Is voltage-controlled oscillators, voltage-controlled filters, voltage-controlled amplifiers, right? Um, there are plenty of, you know, synths, and those are called VCFs, VCAs, VCOs, that kind of stuff. So if you see that on a, link, on a, on a sheet or something describing a synth, that's what that means. You see DCOs, DCAs, DCS, that means digitally controlled oscillators, digitally controlled filters, digitally controlled amplifiers. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just different. Uh, so like a dig something that's digitally controlled is going to be consistent. Something that's voltage controlled means that there's going to be fluctuation and differentiation. That's generally speaking what people love about analog things in general. Um, but I, I like that with analog synths as well. Um, <clears throat> so the thing is, is that bringing an analog synth in, right, to your project, recording it in through a preamp, an analog preamp makes a difference. It really does. It, 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 it elevates the sound. And so that's one first thing that I don't want to say that you have to do that because it's absolutely not imperative. But, you know, you have to realize that we have gotten to the point that digital audio is extremely good. Extremely good. And it's just different than analog audio. It's not better or worse. It's just different. Right? So you pull up a digital synth, it's going to sound like it has a lot of body and dimension and presence on the speakers already if it's a if it's a good digital synth and honestly at this point a lot of them are so right off the bat if you want your analog sound to to compete with that and sound as rich and as lush right you need to make sure that you're bringing it in appropriately so like you know plugging it into your focus right scarlet preamps honestly just isn't gonna do it in my opinion like if you really want to get it get the most out of your synth i would highly recommend pairing it either with a uad apollo or a real analog um, uh, preamp and just like a line preamp, you know, um, I, I've noticed a massive difference in sound, especially on the mini log, I have to say. Um, and the Moog sounds really punchy and warm through there. Anyway, I'm going to shut the fuck up and start making music. So 
this is a preset of mine that I made on the on the Moog. And so what I'm going to do is is that I already know what I want to kind of start with um, in terms of a, a music. I just want to start with like a something like intense, right? That's going to build an intensity. And I'm hearing A in my brain. You know, so the way that I use analog synthesizers is sometimes I play them live, but a lot of the times I'm just seek, I'm using them like a digital synth. It's just that I'm, my source code, so to speak, is something that's much more powerful. Um, so we're gonna imagine that like this is a whole scene of a film or something, right? Um, and so this is gonna be the thing in the background that's kind of driving the energy of it the whole time. I treat it almost like it's a drum. I'm going to be pretty mobile today, so I'm going to be carrying this around with me. So I'm going to start it off, first of all. So one thing that's really important, in my opinion, when using an analog synth, okay, so hold on, this is a good question. From Chris, what do you think about mixing desk preamps then summed through an audio interface? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, mixing desk pre's are, I mean, look, at the end of the day, like a channel strip, they, those just initially were, were removed from consoles. Like, that's why this, they, it's just that people started loving the consoles so much. They're like, well, you know, I don't want to pay 80 grand for a Neve, but I'd love to pay $1,000 for one strip from an 88 RS, you know, or whatever it was. Uh, so yeah, I mean, if because at the end of the day, I'm I'm also bringing my my console, my not my console, but my my preamps in through you know, um, an audio interface. It has to get to the computer somehow. Uh, and yes, the the movie is in space. Yeah, we are working. Okay, that's a great question, T.W. Industries. What kind of movie are we working on? It's gonna be a, a sci-fi thriller that starts on Earth, but expanses all across the universe so it's going to be it's going to be intense but a little bit trippy too so one big thing that's important to discuss with um analog sound design and just sound design in general is you really want to manipulate your modulation depth on the filter and so right what that does is that that introduces action into the filter so right now if i press play right my filter is only responding to my cutoff And that's not like the greatest sound. It's 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 not a bad sound. It's very it's cool, but that can be a lot better. So I want you to listen to what happens when I turn up the modulation depth on the on the filter in the Moog. And by the way, modulation depth in a filter, what that basically does is, is it causes the filter to open and close every time that the note triggers the synth or triggers the oscillator. And so you get this result. <laughs> That's bad funny. Uh, yeah, preamps do improve the sound space facts. What they do is they add body, dimension, weight, presence to the sound. And so the reason I mention that is because with digital synthesizers, they actually already have quite a nice body and dimension on the speaker. And sometimes to compete against that, you need to actually, you want to make sure that your, your amps, your, your, I'm sorry, your synthesizer that you're bringing in is amped properly. So as you can hear, right, this now adds a little bit more definition and forwardness to the synth even when it's closed. So using your modu uh, you know, modulation depth on the filter is, is key, key, key to just designing a good sound. Also on digital sounds, right? So this is just general synthesis thing. 
Um, I, I'm not sure, but you don't need to use logic. I use Ableton all the time. I don't know why I use Open Logic today. I just was in the mood. So what I'm also gonna do is I'm gonna I'm gonna use some noise. I love you getting white noise involved when I'm using an analog synth. That's without noise. That's with noise. It just it just gives it a nice kind of warmth. And so what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna basically, let's see, how much time was that? That's perfect, oh, that's two and a half minutes? All right, let's go a little bit longer. Let's get to a three minute scene in this movie, okay. <clears throat> so this is the scene where they're getting ready to, um, let's see, they're getting ready to go to space for the first time and travel to a new dimension. So this is gonna be the, that's what we're gonna start attempting to do right so this is gonna i'm gonna say this like moog and i'm gonna call this a synth tronome because i'm a total nerd and i'm calling it a synth tronome because it is going to be the metronome for the rest of my music yeah noise is also awesome Um, that's a really good question between um, uh, from TW Industries. Okay, so I actually <sighs> you're not necessarily looking for color. It really just depends on what you want, you know. Um, I actually think for me, my favorite preamp that I have for my my um, my sense is the Summit Audio uh, 2BA 221 basically just because it's this combination of solid stu uh, solid state and tube so basically the the line in is solid state as is the mic in but the actual the output stage is tube so it gives it that really nice kind of warmth where just you know it, it will kind of like if you get that gain staging balance nicely which i'm actually not using right now by the way i'm just using my uad stuff because it's quicker um but i mean i would say a reference preamp wouldn't be the worst idea, if I'm being totally honest, uh, for analog synths, because then you're, you're getting the truest character of the synth, you know, so it's really just depends on what you want. Um, I honestly, I love also though, and this is like the opposite of what I just said, but I like, um, my heritage audio HA 73 sounds bananas on synths. Uh, it adds a lot of weight and dimension, which is really nice. And there's already a lot of weight and dimension with these synths, you know? So that, that's a great question. Um, it really, I think honestly, look overall, solid state pre's are gonna be better for analog synths just because there's so much detail in every part of the frequency spectrum, um, and so you really don't want to like get breakup, you know? You want like, and you don't want you don't want like to to smooth things out necessarily. Um, you actually want to keep things quite punchy and articulate and detailed, you know? Which uh, when it comes to transient information, as you're probably aware, tubes aren't really ideal for you know maintaining transient fidelity so i would recommend a solid state pre um yeah anyway okay so let's do this so i just want a little pitch bend right there
That did perfectly. Okay, so let's see a couple things. Okay, these are all really good questions. Yeah, exactly. I mean, okay, so sorry, I'm like reading things and responding, you know what I'm saying. Okay, so. All right. What if you don't know what sound you want yet? Do you play around on the piano first to get the idea out? Um, I Okay, so people have different approaches to this, you know. I have a friend who's a super badass music producer that is great at sound design, but um, he actually writes all of his music literally on a piano um, before he records it, right? He doesn't use analog stuff, but but still, you know, uh, even just from the digital perspective, he's, he's, he's planning out what he wants to do, right? Um, so I personally think that the, the, the tone can inspire you, right? I really believe in that. So, like... Um, I don't know that I would have performed that section the same way if I had a different sound, right? Because like for me, that sounds intense. That sounds deep. So that I want to I want to stretch the intensity as much as possible, right? So for instance, I was inspired to do the pitch bend thing, which I should have probably just recorded into the 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 MIDI, so I didn't have to do it every time. But it also added a really cool level of imperfection, which I actually think also is really great for like a film score or something. Um, but also just in music, like I'm a huge fan of human error and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, but again, like, I don't know that if I didn't have that deep tone, I would have been inspired to hear the doom, 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 like the cool little pitch bend thing. Right. Um, yeah. And so, okay. So to answer Stavros's question and, and no worries about noob questions or anything like that, you know, don't think about it like that. I mean, this stuff is complex. So basically the way that I set this up is I created an external MIDI track, and this works exactly the same way in Ableton, by the way. So, like, the, the only thing you have to do is you go in there and you you just click external MIDI instrument in instruments. So it's fundamentally the same thing. And then what it does is instead of having this, this window here to decide, you just decide it in the instrument in Ableton when it pops up. So what I already know, like, where I have things set up. So I have a synth on every single one of these ports, right? So I have eight synths coming in and out of this computer. Uh, I have a MIDI interface. So MIDI interface is really important to do, to use this. Uh, and space facts, I'm going to get to your question in a second. I'm just going one at a time. Uh, and so what this allows me to do, right, is I can use my synths like they are um, MIDI instruments, essentially, in my computer. That's just their, it's, I'm just utilizing their sound engine, right? Uh, and so the MIDI interface usually will plug in USB to your computer, but then what you actually do is, is you use real MIDI cables, to run the ins and outs. Uh, that's effective because when you're sending it over USB, things get a little bit screwed up. Uh, like channels will cross over and you also want to be able to do this kind of stuff, right? Which is where you actually set the MIDI channel on the synth, the receiving and sending channel. Now, the reason that's important is because in theory, I could have a bunch of MIDI throughs going, right? Uh, and MIDI through just allows you to pass MIDI information through one synth to another. And I could use, you know, channel six for one and channel 12 for one, even though they're both on port one. So in theory, you know, whatever eight times 16 is, I think it's 96, right? I actually could have 96 synths going at once. Now, I don't think that would work well, but, you know, it could be done. Um, yeah, so the arpeggiator, it's not that it's setting the tempo, but I'm just having, I'm using it as to hold tempo musically. So it'd be the same exact thing in, um, in uh in ableton right it's just that i'm saying it's holding tempo it's a it's a it's yeah, okay cool so that's that's the pressure oh yeah, yeah yeah okay sorry I, I didn't understand what your question was space facts yeah so i basically this sets the tempo right of my project and then this information gets sent out to my synth so that's what i was just able to record and use really quickly all right so i have that back So on its own, that sounds fine, right? It gets starts to sound really cool. So right here, what I started doing was, is I took the oscillator and started tuning it up in real time. 
right? To like build suspense for the part where they're all right, they're getting ready to go through the black hole or whatever it is that we're saying is happening, right? And so I like that you can do that on analog synth. You could also So it sounds it, it sounds nice, right? Um, but yeah, I like being. That's one thing that I like about analog synths is how tactile they are, right? So I can make that decision decision to be inspired in real time. I don't have to route a bunch of knobs and say, okay, I'm going to, um, you know, uh, I'm going to, you know, adjust this, this, and that. Like I think the cool thing about having an analog synth, is especially if you're doing like a little jam like that, like, even though I plan like. I didn't plan that out, but I was feeling it out. Like I knew that, like, okay, I'm going to have 113 bars and I'm going to have it span that section. Um, you know, I think it's nice to be able to just feel, feel like a spontaneous burst of inspiration, you know, to start tuning it up like I was doing and not have to press pause in the project and, you know, reset the automation, all this stuff. So the, what's one thing I love about analog synth is that you can do the automation live and it's, and it's in there and it's done, right? So I, I personally recommend doing that. That's just me. Anyway, so this sounds nice, but it's a little dry, right? Can you make this variations without using external synth? Um, not really. Oh, oh, can you make these variations? Yes, yes, of course you can make these variations. So you can detune the oscillator if that's an option in the um, in your in your you know digital synth. I will say, however, that one thing that I love about this particular uh, synth and also the mini log is that the range for detuning is like <laughs> a lot, you know. So it, it spans more than one octave, or sometimes on a digital synth it only span two or four octaves or something like that. All of this can be accomplished. Everything that I just did can be done on a digital synth. It would just take longer. So I have to automate it all or at least map the parameters, right? And start doing all that stuff. But yeah, don't think that you can't get the, an approximation of that sound from a digital synth. You could. The main difference that I will say, however, is this, is that the sound doesn't get harsh when I start opening the cutoff filter more and more. And that is one thing that happens with digital sounds, I find a lot of times, is that basically above like 10K, they start sounding thin and harsh and awful. Um, so I don't think you can get this level of clarity and detail, right? Like you really hear the harmonics and the richness of the synth. You're not going to get that digitally. I don't care what synth you're using. It's just not going to happen at that frequency range. This is so gooey and warm, right? Now, that also has to do with the fact that, you know, Moog uses these ladder filters, which are just so, so nice. Um, that's a conversation for another time for, for further nerddom. Anyway, so what I'm going to do is, is there are a couple ways to process this, right? But I'm actually going to take uh, a reverb and I'm going to put it directly onto here. Now, I'm hoping this won't cause latency. If it does, I'll use a different reverb. I've been loving this reverb. So one really cool thing you can do is, by the way, super important before I go on, I tracked, I tracked this in mono. All right? That's another thing, is that whenever you use a digital synth, more often than not, <clears throat> it's going to be stereo. <clears throat> They'll sometimes give you an option to mono, to use mono which I think is great. But one thing that is not talked about enough in electronic music is that one of the biggest secrets in mixing, right, to getting a great mix, is what to have in mono and what to have in stereo. If everything is stereo, your mix is going to be a fucking disaster, right? Now, samples can be mono, even though they present as stereo. It means they're just in one spot, right? But there's honestly even just a difference between like recording something down the middle that stays in mono and recording something down the middle that stays in stereo. Um, it's just a very, it's slightly more tucked and pinched in mono. Um, also, you get less stereo width from mono, which sucks, right? So you hard pan something that's mono. It actually will feel less wide than when you hard pan something that's stereo, um, which is a little weird. But for bass in particular, always use mono. There's I mean, there are reasons to use stereo, right? But if you plan on having your bass down the middle, use mono and forget about it, right? Also, if you're planning on panning things around the mix like crazy, you're probably going to want to use, again, mono, right? So to be clear, mono just means it's one audio source, 
and it's only in one position in the stereo field. That's the, only way, that's the way I always explain it, right? It can only be in one position in the stereo field at a, at a time. A lot of people think mono means down the middle. It doesn't mean down the middle, right? It just means it's in one position in the stereo field at a time, at least when in a recording context. Um, stereo, right, means that it can be anywhere and everywhere at all times in the, in this, in the uh, stereo field, right? So the other thing is, right, is that if you want to record an analog, uh, analog synth in stereo, um, you need to make sure that you're coming, you have both, you know, both plugged in, the left and the right out. Uh, and if you're coming in through an analog synth that's not matched, that's one, uh, sorry, analog preamp that's not like matched, that's one drawback, you know, that you might consider. I personally love that. I think any way that you can introduce imperfections into music, make it more classic and more human sounding. Anyway, so what I'm going to do is, is I'm actually going to make this stereo. Right? So you're like, you just gave this whole spiel about why things should be mono versus stereo. Well, I want this to actually be huge sound. And so I'm going to convert it to stereo, right, with this reverb. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put on a gentle amount of reverb just to get it, let it breathe a little bit, right? Because this is, this is true about synths in general. Um, and I find this a little bit more about analog synths than digital synths, which is interesting. Um, they, they sometimes sound a little bit less wet than, than than digital synths um not always really depends on the synth um like especially once that filter opened it sounded very very wet you know i, I don't know how to explain that any other way just kind of gooey resonant colorful um but when it's closed a little bit more uh it, it really feels more closed which not, whereas on a digital synth sometimes it actually even when it's closed it feels a little bit like more colorful which is kind of a bizarre thing I don't know how to explain it any other way. I probably didn't explain that very well. But um, I'm going to keep this width at 100%, mix down to 15, and let's just see what this sounds like. even that little bit so when it opens up more there we go so it's not even a matter of less stereo width with mono there's Oh, oh wait, less stereo width. Um, all I mean is that when you hard pan mono to the left, it actually will be less wide than if you have stereo information and something is in is is hard left in the stereo field. Kind of weird. Um, So for instance, like right here, one thing that you could do, which I'm not necessarily gonna do, but you know, you could actually like this is a little bit ticky sounding, a little bit plucky sounding in a bad way. Like like there's a certain like kind of little clickiness to it that I don't love. So I can turn on the attack. Which is doing nothing. So forget about it. I'm just gonna leave it. Forget I ever said anything. All right, so let's now go to, let's do more Moog. And what I'm gonna do this time is I'm gonna use only the noise envelope on the synth. later so we get this
Now I'm going to show you one of my favorite things to do, which is I use tons of guitar pedals on my synths. This is like one of the biggest secrets. People that use a lot of analog synths and that really incorporate in their production usually realize that, oh shit, if I run this through a guitar pedal, it's going to sound, it's going to do something to the sound that's a little bit different. So I'm going to run it through one of my favorite, favorite effects pedals um, called the uh, Maris Polymoon. It's super wild. And I already have this kind of set up to come in through here. This sounds pretty crazy, so get ready. Woo! Yeah, so this is going to add a lot of, this does really crazy things. When I, this does really crazy things when I start opening up the filter. Oh yeah, and I actually have it already set up so that's running through my Ventress dual reverb, which is a super sick reverb. And I'm going to put it on a massive reverb setting. really have a huge soundscape now right so that avoids me also having to use a plugin save cpu so i'm just going to go ahead let me start this I might do some really weird shit. I just got inspired. This is why I love analog sense. I might intermittently throughout just turn on one of the oscillators. Could sound really weird. So I'm just kind of preparing for that. So a lot of the times when I'm when I'm recording analog synths and using them, one thing that I'm doing is I'm setting up the sound. I, I, we don't have time to do it, so I'm kind of speeding through it. But I'll usually set up the sound very meticulously um, because with a digital sound, right, you don't have to commit. Whereas with an analog sound, you're committing. So um, you, you really want to um, make sure that what you're recording sounds awesome. And this is one of the secrets to, analog, to, to getting your analog synths to fit into your production is... Don't just design something you're like, oh, that, that's good enough. That sounds close. No, get exactly what you want. Who cares if it takes you 25 minutes? Because here's the difference is that that 25 minutes that you just spent designing that sound, you're never going to have to touch it again once you record it. Maybe you do a little bit of EQ to cut out some lows, right? If it's getting in the way of your kick. Maybe you do a little bit of EQ to take out some 500 or something, right? If it's, if it's muddying up your mid-range or whatever it is. But, like, you shouldn't really have to... Um, adjust it too much especially once you start using um like pedals to give it that extra little level of character to situate it in the context of space or modulation right then all of a sudden uh you have something that's literally just ready to go i don't fully understand your question artifact you said low pass cutoff at the end of the cutoff i don't i don't really get what you mean but it's using a low pass uh, I am using a low pass setting. Anyway, so I'm going to go ahead and record this now. So that's the little thing where I just flicked on the oscillator.
I'm going to now do is I'm going to change the timing of the delay on this delay pedal and really weird trippy things are going to start happening. a little confused i'm sorry <laughs> I, don't get what, I don't get what you mean by the reverb at the end of the cutoff anyway so <clears throat> again now i have this whole let's compare this now to be a little bit quieter. That explains everything. We have this now layered on top. So one thing to bear in mind is, look at what's going on in the EQ. It's pretty nicely balanced. It's not really operating too much in here. So we don't need to cut anything out. We could, just so you can see what it sounds like. Oops. That makes the low end a little bit clearer. But it also takes away some of the overall color. So one thing that I really like to do is I actually try to like avoid EQing analog synths at all costs. I think it cheapens them tremendously. Like the whole point is to get is to really design a nice sound and keep it. It's the same way that like if you record something really well, you don't really want to EQ it. Like the whole point is that you recorded it really well and it sounds beautiful. Um, so EQ should be something, you know, to fix and improve. But if you're using a good synth coming in through a good preamp and you use good sound design, then you shouldn't really have to touch it that much. You know, like, yeah, there'll be maybe some crazy resonance you have to get rid of or something like that, but like overall. So let's... 
I'm just going to keep using the Moog. I don't know. It's kind of so sick. I'm having a great time with it. Uh, let's see if I can. And so let's, we're going to pull it in through this crazy setup that I have again. Maybe this time I'll, I'll take off the crazy wishy-washy shit. And I'll just use the reverb. Yeah, so let's create like the quintessential drone sound in a movie. Right? That 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 you know that every Christopher Nolan movie has. That like every movie does these days. I love that shit. It's so it's like a very it's getting very overdone, but yeah, it's like every movie does that. It's pretty cool. So I'm gonna use yeah, I'm just gonna use this make get that MIDI out of the way because it's gonna trigger it every time. Trying to get pretty crazy. Uh, yeah, the big. This is the big spaceship, the alien spaceship. This is gonna be the sound for the alien spaceship coming into view. And so, like, that's a nice sound. It's like a little, a little annoying. Um, so when I put, I'm just gonna click the reverb pedal, and now. Get that crazy fucking sound. <laughs> I'm going to increase the modulation depth on the reverb too. gonna alternate between those little synth this filter opens I'm 
or just build it in intensity. That got fun. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing that's missing for that folks that I need to get a pedal for is a, is a hold pedal, because then you can just let go of the note and just start modulating like a psychopath, which is what I like to be doing instead of just one thing at a time. Um, all right, so let's let's listen to what that did. Things start getting exciting around here. Binds all together. Woo! Now I'm building in anticipation. So we're gonna make a crazier, more intense drone to go in there because you never have enough drones. But we're gonna make this one super dry, right? So it's gonna be like the opposite. It's gonna be really like in your face and scary almost. Um, and I'm going to try to use this, uh, the polymoon to give it more width and spatial dimension, kind of like a chorus without actually making it feel like it's in space. So basically I'm just going to take the time and turn it way down.
that's just see this is why i love touching gear because i, I didn't intend to do that but that's way cooler than what i was gonna do Me just slightly adjusting the timing on the delay so yeah the aliens are that's the aliens starting to talk <laughs> and so i was gonna try to put that in here let's see what that sounds like here there's two levels of dimension here maybe i'll we'll start like that and now you know in, in my mind processing analog synths is as much about uh manipulating it in conjunction with another device right i always think that like uh it's like you know cooking um, if you have really high quality ingredients to start off with, it's not that hard to improve it to something that's like way crazier. Um, or it's like, or rather it's like, you know, it's, it's better to work with high quality ingredients. So a lot of, I just use my, use, view my sense a lot of the time as high quality ingredients, right? It's not the end fact. Um, what's the sound of the laser cannon the spaceship uses? Oh man, we're gonna have to get there in a, in a second, but right now this is just going to be the trippy sort of thing that goes along with it. Um, but so yeah, I just wanted to point out real quick that with the, because of the pedal, you can hear it down the middle and out wide. But if I put the mix up all the way on the pedal, now it's only out wide. And I already have that sound in the middle, so I'm just gonna do that. I actually like it with the mix knob rolled back a little bit just so that they sort of so that they sort of mask each other, the transients. I like that. So that's just gonna be sitting there on top. So what I might actually do is oh the left side's coming out. That's perfect. There's a low cut, there's a high pass filter on my um on my preamp. So I turn them off. That gets way cheaper, which I don't want. So that's good. So I can actually just have that sound sit right on top of that other sound. I'm gonna start manipulating it in a like a weirdo. I'm actually going to start it with where you don't hear the pitching, the weird chorusing effect. We're just going to start like that and quickly now move into this. That is a crazy thing rhythmically. Holy shit.
I could solo it, right? Because it's still recording everything else. I just want to hear what's going on. I have to let that sound roll for a bit. I like that. It's a weird texture. Maybe now I'll turn the feed back up. The, the timing of the delay, so now it's tightening. So I, I, I kind of class um, using pedals in the same category as like manipulating analog synths because they just end up getting so much, you can get so much character out of it. So check this out at the end. That's, that's pretty fun. I can't, you know, hard to deny that. So we can listen to how my manipulation of this pedal was really more driving the performance this time than the synth itself. That's just me literally just adjusting the time. Woo! Yeah, we're accelerating. Yeah, beyond the black rainbow. Yeah. Now we're. Uh, Interesting. <laughs> so we're now gonna keep it mad loud because I like just all this detail coming in. See now watch this, I can probably even take the reverb off. Yeah, I like that a lot more now. So context is everything, right? In composition. Uh so like this felt dry at first, this this sound, but within the context of everything else we've created now, that has that there's a place that's coming from a place, and it's actually much tighter on the speaker. Without the reverb, let's see what it sounds like over here. Ah, fuck it, I love reverb so much. I'm gonna keep the reverb on the sucker for it. Well, having it resolved to a chord. Oh, oh. Um, that's super funny. Yeah, Brittany Newman, you missed it, but I said I was going to literally try to make something to a score to a fake movie that sounds like Tenet because I watched it yesterday. Um, yeah, that would be really cool. Having it resolved to a chord, just like, mm, I hear what you're saying. That could be really, really cool. Um, all right, well, actually, to that very point, I'm going to try to throw in some, some something melodic now. Crazy delay pedal put on my reverb here. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> resolve into an explosion. It resolves into going into the black hole. That's what this is the build up to. Is it's like, what's gonna happen when we go to the black hole? What's gonna happen? Everything starts warping, everything starts shifting. Ah, everything's going crazy, right? That's not magic. This is what I'm talking about. Oh my god, that never is gonna accidentally happen with a digital synth. I just literally click. That's that's one of my presets called pituation, like a situation with a pitch. And that sounds so fucking cool. Ah, I know I have to include that. You have better ears than I do, man. So what I'm actually gonna do is I'm gonna ride the output of the synth. I want that to come in and out. I don't want it to be there the whole time. That'd be super annoying. So maybe I'll have it be just there in the back. Let's see. I'm going to just ride the output. So this is, again, it's like, it's like live volume automation. So it's all about performance, right? Is that like one of the things that gets lost in digital music production is that is performance, right? You, you want to perform the music. We, people connect to intention, you know? So if you hear me, even if, like, like somewhere in your brain, you understand that as I'm like doing these little things, that's happening, that's, it's real. Someone's doing that, something is doing that, right? It's, it's, it's like a force of nature in some capacity. guys with me I forgot so I'm just slowly bringing it in slowly emerging from the reverb right use the aliens going the trippiness Maybe I'll even adjust the mix on the reverb so it comes forward the mix.
You know, bringing it up again. Now I'm going to increase the reverb time. Increase the modulation depth. Okay, so now let's. There is a, there there is a chord emerging in there, by the way. It's a fifth, right? So yeah, it's a fifth. That's a fifth right there. So that's a five. And you were very very correct. Um, but damn, really, really dope that you called that. That you, I didn't realize you were talking about it first, but yeah, that's 100% correct. Subtonic, right there, boom. Um, okay, so I'm actually gonna now plug in my profit. So one thing that can work really well if you're doing something like this, which is like a soundscape, right, with, with analog synths and stuff, is um, I love this idea of like a processing chain. Um, you know, so historically speaking, it's like you use a console, right? You bring everything in through um, a console. It gives it this kind of glued sound, right? Just creating some sort of in ch incoming chain where it's like everything gets processed through that chain, even if it's only minorly, it gives it this kind of glue. It's like it makes... It makes you under intuitively like perceive it all as one thing. You know, it doesn't mean that it makes it good. It just helps glue it together. Everything else still has to be correct, but that little—that's like that extra little layer of like, oh, I'm bringing everything into the exact same preamp with the exact same settings, right? Through the exact same two pedals, which you might be like, that's boring. But the other way to think about it is that it's also harmonically gluing, so it's going to give it like a console sound, except for the summing part. I know, I know TWD is going to call me out on that. Oh, I like that idea as well, TWD, the idea of like the shots. <laughs> so it could be used, well, yeah, cutting to shots in, oh yeah, that's really cool. Into the ship or the shots, whatever. Yeah, that's really cool. So yeah, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to use my profit to express melody because that is um, that is uh, polyphonic and it's beautiful I also focus monophonic but it's just it's going to take it to a whole other level when we can add a chord in here or two chords or, or at least like a pad that took the cancel
actually here it's clipping the preamp slightly right there. So I have to turn down the I'm actually just gonna turn down the turn down the output on the profits just a little bit. Turn turn up the output of the I'm being, you know, to, to, I think it was, I forget who asked earlier, but like, do you start with the idea on the synth or on the, in the, the melody? Well, I wanted to make a melody, but all of a sudden, you know, I started doing weird things with the prophets. Like, <laughs> that's kind of sick. I think I was going to do some crazy pitch bends. So I got that wrong, right? So I'm going to restart it.
It's <laughs> getting my adrenaline going, man. <laughs> Could be superfluous. Let's see. See maybe if we tuck it in there a little bit more. So one thing that I might actually do is I might just like throw on a compressor um, to catch all the peaks. So instead of like automating all of this, which would honestly be kind of a pain in the ass. I mean, not really, but at least for right now, I do this a lot of times. It's like a start. Uh, I just set a quick attack, kill the front, long, long release, high ratio, basically creating a limiter here. Um, and it's only going to catch like... We're gonna, I'm going to make this note the litmus test. This seems to be just as loud as all the other shit over here. So I just want to make sure that it doesn't catch anything here, but that it does catch right here. That's perfect. So it's catching it immediately, and not touching any other good stuff. So over here, if we start getting louder, it should catch stuff. So I do agree with, I can't read your name, but the superfluous comment, I agree with that. I think that at this point it gets superfluous. I like this as a build up tool to get us to this moment though. moment we bring in now a synth doing actual uh, melody I think that's actually probably <laughs> that's probably good. I don't think we actually need to add anything to this. This is the so here. Uh let's see. Exterior outer space. The spaceship slowly moves towards the black hole. 
as they get closer and closer, the ship starts to shake. As they get closer and closer, it looks like there's something actually coming out of the black hole. Not only them going in, but they can't be sure. They're trying to look closer. Cut to all their faces, feeling terrified, right? Feeling confused. They're getting closer, right? The darkness is growing, the darkness is growing. But again, it still looks like something might be coming through on the other side. And they start approaching the black hole. The ship is shaking more and more. They're just getting closer and closer and closer and closer. You want a kick? You want some kick? have no kick and then this is what we'll bring in the kick Start distorting it like a psychopath as it, as it goes more and more over here. You just get that crazy shit. You can see those square waves. I'm destroying my, my, my converters right now. Yeah, in a good way. I'm just, I'm just clipping them so hard. Cramp converters with drums. It's actually kind of cool.
was a kick drum module that I was able to send it to called the uh, M-Base 11. I'm just going to type that in there because that, that's, that's a cool one. So yeah, so that's like the sickest kick drum module in the universe, um, as you can hear. <laughs> I was just pitching it up in real time. We'll just do that. So you also can still edit a little bit, you know. So maybe there it's just like you, you have to create a little bit of a crossfade. Kind of a shame to do that, but for the end of the scene, you know, we need to get into the next scene. So maybe I would just use, you know, just a filter right there at the end. Just like that. And... Again, to the point of performance, I might just perform that sweep so I get it really exact. Oh, that isn't exactly where I wanted to get it. That's not how I wanted it to go. Let's see. Still didn't like that. Maybe, you know, I got it right the first time and I didn't record it, which is super annoying. So let's see though, see how it feels. what the issue is here uh, so i'm just gonna i'm gonna automate it in as much as i hate doing that let's find a spot where i want it to start dipping seemed cool. Maybe I'll just mute it down. That was pretty wacky. <laughs> um, yeah, so I appreciate all you guys uh, tuning in. Thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that note at the end there, man. On the, um, I wish I knew how to pronounce your name, but it looks cool. Um, yeah, throwing the kick in definitely did something pretty cool. <laughs> Yeah, I want more.
more time. Man, I was saying so many heartfelt things. Oh, man. Um, <laughs> that's so funny. Okay, yeah. Well, first of all, I did a really cool thing which you guys didn't do and up here. And uh, right at the end of this, I, I said, Coming January 4th, 343, Season 3. <laughs> anyway, um, thank you guys for being here. I don't have to do my whole spiel again. But um, look, bottom line is i you know it's really inspiring to have you guys always around um for those of you who have come through and it seems like there have been some new people tuning in recently you know it always um is a very very uh inspiring thing to have have people be there and participating it was actually i love today how much everyone was participating this was super fun um and so yeah when we come back next season for uh you know next year also um which hopefully will be a much better year to your point uh t whoever it was that said that Andrew. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, you know, I, I hope to see some of you guys back around and, um, and now, now we're hot. <laughs> okay. Hopefully now we're not too hot. Sorry about that. I just got all lost in, in the synth noises. Um, yeah, you know, thanks everyone for tuning in. That's, this is the most jumbled season finale conclusive conclusion monologue ever. It's pretty terrible, but I hope you guys forgive me. As I was saying, I'm going to go watch Liverpool play Tottenham because I'm a huge Liverpool fan. That game started one minute ago, and I'm already having a panic attack. Um, so, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, you know, stay tuned to, you know, keep on the airwaves. Uh, look out for us. We're going to be coming back. I think January 4th is when we're restarting. I'll be streaming again and going to have a lot of new really fun stuff for you guys. So, um, yeah. Uh, take it easy, stay safe, stay positive, stay hopeful. You know, music has the ability to, you know, make the world seem okay or make the world be okay, but maybe it doesn't seem okay. So, uh, you know, I hope that you guys have an inspired and inspiring and safe holidays wherever you are tuning in from around the world. And, uh, this is Lewis Beck signing off to another dimension. Boop.